Okay. Good morning, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon, honey. Hi, how is everybody doing? Let's good. Good. Everybody in. I'm just a little bit late, I guess. It's, um... Good afternoon, Dija. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm good. Let's see. We're gonna. We're going to work on reading the, in the book, get ready to do some more writing. Did anybody have problems with the homework that they would like to look at or is everything okay? Okay, you have a link now in the Canvas homepage in front there is a link that says to week 16. And that's what we're going to be doing today is looking at part <laughs> two. We're going to look part two of the Joy Luck Club. And what I'm going to do is um, let you listen to these be just these beginning parts on pages 34 and 35 and then i'll read through and then we'll look at um we'll look at reading actually we're going to call this reading for meaning and not reading for details because it's they're a little bit deeper more complicated questions than just details but right now why don't you just listen this is on page 34 of the book, and this is actually Amy Tan. This is the author herself reading this section of the book that is on page 34. So you can just have a chance to listen to her voice instead of mine. So we're on 34, it's after 33. There's no page number on the book, but it's the 26 malignant gates. Malignant means very bad. I'll give you a vocabulary note. Okay, well, we're going to call this um, background and vocabulary notes for part two. And this sounds like it is the title of a Chinese book that a mother is talking about to her child. And so here is Amy Tan reading that part herself. Excuse me, Amy. Uh -huh. It's 26 or 27. Oh, 26. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yes. Very yes. sorry. <laughs> Thank you for catching things like that. 
Every time I make silly mistakes like that, let me know, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the very is the different meaning, very and very. I'm sorry, say that again. You're writing the very bad, it's a very bad. Yeah, malignant means very bad. Oops. Thank you. Another stupid mistake. Thank you very much. Very bad. Yeah. Yeah. I think that V A R Y is the different meaning, yeah? A very, yeah, with an A, it's a different meaning, right? Yeah. A very means to be different, it's a verb. Okay. So now let's listen. The twenty six malignant gates. Do not ride your bicycle around the corner, the mother had told the daughter when she was seven. Why not, protested the girl. I cannot see you and you will fall down and cry and I will not hear you. How do you know I'll fall, whined the girl. It is in a book, The 26 Malignant Gates. All the bad things that can happen to you outside the protection of this house. I don't believe you. Let me see the book. It is written in Chinese. You cannot understand it. That is why you must listen to me. What are they then, the girl demanded. Tell me the 26 bad things. But the mother sat knitting in silence. What 26, shouted the girl. The mother still did not answer her. You can't tell me because you don't know. You don't know anything. And the girl ran outside, jumped on her bicycle, and in her hurry to get away, she fell before she even reached the corner. The English got changed a little bit. Remember, the book we're reading is an ESL adaptation. So what they did in the book is change the vocabulary a little bit from the original but it's close enough, so I think you could probably follow it. And then the other reading you see on the next page is called American Translation. And I'm going to, this is me reading this, okay. American Translation. Oh, cried the mother, seeing the mirror in the bedroom of her daughter's new apartment. You cannot put mirrors at the foot of the bed. All your marriage happiness will jump back and turn the opposite way. That's the only place where it can go, said the daughter, annoyed that her mother saw bad omens in everything. An omen means a, a, a sign that something bad will, that something is going to happen in the future. She had heard these warnings all her life. Huh, lucky I can fix it for you then. And the mother took out the little mirror she had bought as a housewarming present. A housewarming present is a present you give to someone when they move into a home, new home. When people move into a new home, sometimes they have a party and it's called a housewarming party. Housewarming means sell, moving into a new home. Hang it up there, she said, pointing to the wall above the bed. This mirror sees that mirror. It will increase your peach blossom luck. What is peach blossom luck? The mother smiled. It is in here, she said, pointing to the mirror. Look inside. In this mirror is my future grandchild. 
lying in my arms next spring. And the daughter looked, and there it was, her own reflection, looking back at her. Mm -hmm. These readings before the chapters are a little bit mysterious and difficult to talk about exactly what they mean, but they're uh, to think about a little bit before we go in to starting to read the stories themselves. And right now I'm going to go in to page 36. And we'll read the rules of the game. And this is Waverly Jong. She's the daughter of Lindo Jong. What do we remember about Lindo? We read a story about Lindo, right? What did Lindo Jong do in, in the story we read? Which one was she? The red candle. The red candle, right? Okay, she, uh, she was the one who um, got out of a bad marriage by playing a trick, right? She pretended that she had a bad dream, that she was not the real wife of her husband. Very clever, yeah. And the story is called The Red Candle. Okay. So the person talking now is her daughter, whose name is Waverly. I was six when my mother taught me how to have invisible strength. Invisible means cannot nobody can see it. It was a way of winning arguments, respect from others, and eventually, though neither of us knew it then, chess games. And this story is all about chess. The game they're talking about is chess. And we can look at a picture of what that game is. You probably know. That's, um... As I'm reading, actually, you can think about these questions because we're then later going to talk about some questions about this. We're talking about this game of chess. And these are the questions that we're thinking about. I've got one, one, two, I've got five questions, I think. Maybe think about them as you listen to me read. Maybe I'll copy them so they're easier to see in the Word document. Bite back your tongue, scolded my mother when I cried loudly for the delicious salted fruit at our local shop. At home, she said, wise man, he not go against the wind strongest wind cannot be seen. The next week I bit back my tongue as we entered the shop. When my mother had finished her shopping, she quietly took a bag of fruit from the shelf, paid for it and handed it to me. So the mother rewarded her daughter for not speaking about it. We lived in a two bedroom flat in San Francisco's Chinatown. Flat means apartment. above a Chinese baker's shop in Waverly Place. My mother named me after this street. 
Like most of the other Chinese children who played in the back streets of restaurants and tourist shops, I didn't think we were poor. My bowl was always full and we had three large meals a day. My oldest brother was the one who actually got the chess set. We had gone to the Christmas party held by the local church and the kindly gray haired ladies had put together a bag of presents for us children. This is uh, older white ladies making Christmas presents for the Chinese immigrant children. When Vincent got the chess set, my mother bowed and thanked the unknown giver saying, too good, cost too much. An old lady with fine white hair nodded towards our family and said in a whistling whisper, happy, happy Christmas. When we arrived home, my mother told Vincent to throw the chess set away. She not want it, we not want it, she said, throwing her set, head stiffly to one side with a tight, proud smile. My brothers had deaf ears. They were already lining up the chessmen and reading from the well-worn instruction book. I think we've got to another question on our. Okay. Let's copy these questions. Oops. Okay, so we're going to go ahead, uh, page 37, second paragraph. I watched my brothers play during the whole of that week. And this is what we're learning about here. Think about that question while we're reading. The game seemed to hold dark secrets just waiting to be discovered. They finally agreed to let me play, and Vincent read out the rules to me. Later, I read them for myself and looked up all the big words in a dictionary. I borrowed books on chess from the Chinatown Library and studied each piece trying to find the power it contained. I drew a chess board and put it on the wall next to my bed, where at night I could stare for hours at imaginary battles on those 64 black and white squares. Soon, I no longer lost any games, but my brothers lost interest in playing. Fortunately, we had a neighbor, Lao Po, who was an experienced player, and over the weeks, he taught me everything he knew. From him, I learned the base of the secret moves, including their names, the double attack from the east and west shores, throwing stones on the drowning man, the sudden meeting of the family, the surprise from the sleeping guard, the servant who kills the king, sand in the eyes of the advancing enemy, a double killing without blood. These were all ways to play the chess game that had special names. It wasn't long before I was playing in official matches. My mother always came with me sitting proudly beside me and telling my, my admirers with proper Chinese modesty, it's luck, that's all. When I played, I didn't see the person sitting opposite me. I only saw the black and white chessmen on the board. A light wind blew past my ears, whispering secrets only I could hear. Blow from the south, it murmured, or throw sand from the east to confuse him. And when I won, the wind shouted with laughter and then died down to become my own breath. By my ninth birthday, I'm turning the page now, I was a national chess champion, and people said I had a great future as an international player. My mother decided I did not have to help with the housework anymore, although my brothers protested bitterly about this. But there was one duty I couldn't avoid. When I had no match to play, I had to go shopping with my mother on Saturday market days. She would walk proudly with me, visiting many shops, buying very little, this is my daughter, Waverly Jones. 
she said to whoever looked in her direction. One day after we had left a shop, I whispered, I wish you wouldn't tell everyone I'm your daughter. My mother stopped walking. Okay. Here, we're going to look at the answer to this question here in the middle of page 38. I wish you wouldn't tell everyone I'm your daughter. My mother stopped walking. Crowds of people with heavy bags pushed past us. Ah, uh, yeah, so shame to be with your mother. She held my hand even more tightly as she stared angrily at me. It's not that, it's just so embarrassing. Embarrass you be my daughter? Her voice was cracking with anger. That's not what I meant. That's not what I said. What you say? I knew it was a mistake to say anything more, but I heard my voice speaking. Why do you have to use me to show off? If you want to show off, why, then, why don't you learn to play chess? Show off means... Um, means make a show of how smart and good you are or, or how good you are at something. My mother's eyes turned into dangerous black holes. She had no words for me, just sharp silence. I felt the wind rushing round my hot ears. I pulled my hand out of hers and spun around, turned around fast. Knocking into an old woman who dropped her bag of shopping. Hey, a stupid girl. My mother and the old woman cried. As my mother bent to help the old woman pick up her vegetables, I ran off down the street. I ran and ran until I realized I had nowhere to go. My breath came out like angry smoke. It was cold. I sat down, turning the page, on an upturned bucket, upside down. Imagining my mother searching and calling for me. After two hours, I stood up and slowly walked, ho walked home. I could see the yellow lights shining from our flat like two tiger's eyes in the night. I crept up the steps to the door and quietly turned the handle. The door was locked. I heard a chair move inside. The locks turned and then the door opened. About time you got home, said Vincent. Wow, you really are in trouble. We went back to the dinner table. Standing there waiting for my punishment, I heard my mother speak in a dry voice. We are not concerned with this girl. This girl is not concerned with us. Nobody looked at me. Bone chopsticks knocked against the sides of bowls being emptied into hungry mouths. I walked into my room, closed the door, and lay down on my bed in the dark. In my head, I saw a chessboard. The player opposite had opposite me had eyes like angry black holes in her face. She wore a proud smile. So it was she was playing chess. In her mind, she was playing chess with her mother. She wore a proud smile. Strongest wind cannot be seen, she said. Her black chessmen advanced and my white pieces screamed as they fell off the board one by one. I felt myself growing light. I rose up into the air and flew out the window carried by the wind. Then everything below me disappeared and I was alone. I closed my eyes and thought about my next move. And we're going to come back to this question later on. Right now, we're going to learn about Waverly Jung's life now as an adult. So we're mo now moving after that little symbol in the page. We're shifting in time now to Waverly being grown up. 
many years later, when I was in a well-paid job with my own life, my own home, I still tried to plan moves in the long running battle with my mother. On this occasion, I had taken her out to lunch at my favorite Chinese restaurant in the hope of putting her in a good mood, but it was a disaster. Disaster means it's a terrible event. She disapproved of my new hair coat cut criticized the menu and complained to the waiter that the chopsticks were dirty. Her soup was not hot enough and her tea was too expensive. You shouldn't get so upset, I told you. I told her, bad for your heart. Nothing wrong is wrong with my heart, she replied sharply. And she was right. Despite all the worries she gives herself and others, the doctors say that my mother at 69 has the heart of a 16 year old and the strength of a horse. And that is what she is according to the Chinese calendar, a horse born in 1918, bound to speak her mind in every situation. She and I make a bad combination because I'm a rabbit born in 1951, supposedly sensitive, especially when criticized. They're talking about Chinese astrology And uh, people's, a person's, per, people's personality are influenced by the year when they were born. A lot of you probably know about this. And you can actually Google this. And if you don't know much about it, you can look and see. Okay, you can see what the year you were born and which animal you're associated with and this each of these has personality traits okay i, think I am uh... the english people believe this astrology teacher um european astrology is different it's a different kind of astrology um european astrology there are 12 signs and it depends on your on the uh let's look at this the month you're born, like in the year. Yeah, it's the month, and it's um, it's based on the stars. Okay, everybody has a horoscope. And when they when they make it, it looks like that. And here, here are there are twelve the years divided into twelve months. And for example, this is mine, Virgo here, and your personality is connected to the month when you were born. So it's a different system, but it's a very similar kind of thinking. Let's go back to the, I think we should go back to the story. Let's, um... Okay, so I'm back on page 41, um, going to, it's about a third of the way down. It says, after our miserable lunch, miserable means very sad, very unhappy. I gave up the idea that there would be ever a good time to tell her the news that Rich Shields and I were getting married. My mother had never met Rich. In fact, whenever I mentioned him, she always thought of something else to talk about. So I decided to make her become aware of his place in my life 
by taking her back to my apartment after lunch. She had not been there for months. When I was married to my first husband, she used to arrive with no warning until one day I suggested she should phone in advance. Ever since then, she has refused to come unless I give her an official invitation. So I watched her as she inspected my untidy home, a place full of love and life. Untidy means not, not clean, not, or well, no, it doesn't mean not clean. It means it's a lot of stuff lying around. The beds were unmade. My four-year-old daughter Shoshona's toys were all over the floor and Rich's clothes lay over the backs of chairs. My mother picked her way through the mess, a look of distaste on her face, seeing something not unpleasant. Not liking something. How could she not notice that we were living together? From the wardrobe, a wardrobe is furniture, piece of furniture that's like a closet. It may look, um, Something like that. From a wardrobe. I took a real fur jacket that Rich had given me for Christmas. It was the most expensive present I had ever received. I put it on to show my mother and she was quiet. She ran her fingers over the fur. This is not so good, she said at last. It's just small pieces. Fur is too short. How can you criticize a gift? I protested. I was deeply wounded, it means I was hurt. He gave me this from the heart. That's why I worry, she said. And when I looked at the coat in the mirror, I couldn't resist the force of her opinion. Means her in. It means her opinion made me think in a different way. Her ability to make me see black where there once was white. And that's one of the questions we're thinking about here. Now the coat seemed of poor quality, an imitation of love and affection. Aren't you going to say anything else? I asked softly about all this. I pointed to the signs of rich lying about. She looked around the room and finally she said, you have a job, you are busy, you want to live like mess, what can I say? My mother knows how to hurt me and the pain I feel is worse than any other kind of misery because what she does always comes as a shock which digs itself permanently into my memory. I still remember the first time I felt it. Permanent means forever.
Okay, now uh, we're moving pat, we're moving back in time. You can see there's that symbol on the page and we're gonna move now back to when she was a child again. I was 10 years old. Even though I was young, I knew my skill at playing chess was a gift. It was effortless, so easy. I could see things on the chessboard that other people could not. And this gift gave me a wonderful confidence. I love to win. And my mother loved to show me off. She used to discuss my games as if she had planned how to win them. And to our family friends, she would explain, you don't have to be smart to win chess. It's just tricks. You blow from the north, south, east, and west. Then the other person becomes confused. I hated the way she pretended that she, not I, was the expert. Expert is someone who knows the, whole, the, the topic very well. And one Saturday morning, I told her so in the middle of a crowd of people at the market. That day and the next, she refused to speak to me as, as if she had become invisible and I couldn't, wouldn't speak to her. Many days passed in silence and I sat in my room trying to think of another plan. That's when I decided to give up chess. Of course, I didn't intend to stop forever. I thought she would come to me crying. Why are you not playing? But nothing happened. She said nothing and I was crying inside because I was missing several important matches. I realized she knew more tricks than I thought, but I was tired of her game. So I decided to pretend to let her win. I'm ready to play chess again, I announced to her one day. I imagined she would smile and ask me what special thing I would like to eat. But instead she frowned at me. You think it's so easy, she said. One day stop, next day play. Everything for you is this way, so smart, so easy, so fast. I said, I'll play, I said, beginning to cry. No, she shouted. It was so sudden it made me jump. It is not that so easy anymore. I could not understand what was happening, but I did win my mother back. That night I developed a high fever and she sat next to my bed, feeding me with chicken soup and rice. But after I got well, I discovered that she had changed. She no longer watched over me as I practiced or boasted of my achievements. And when I lost my next match, she said nothing. She almost seemed satisfied as if she had planned it. I was horrified, it means I was shocked and spent many hours going over the moves in my mind. I realized I could no longer see the secret weapons of each chessman or the magic in every square. Over the next few years, I continued to play, but I had lost that feeling of confidence. When I won, I was relieved. And when I lost, I was filled with growing fear that I no longer had the gift and was becoming an ordinary person. When I was 14, I stopped playing chess completely and nobody protested. So that is one of the questions that we're thinking about here. <clears throat> now we're going to move back to when she's an adult. I told a friend what my mother had said about the fur coat Rich had given me, but she couldn't understand my problem. You can tell a tax officer to go to hell, she said. This is talking about Rose's career. No, wait, I'm sorry, excuse me, talking about Waverly's career. But you can't deal with your own mother. Tell her to shut up, stop ruining your life. But this time I wasn't so much afraid of my mother as a, I was afraid for Rich. I already knew how she would attack and criticize him. And I was afraid that some of the unseen dust of the truth would fl fly into my eye, <coughs> confuse what I was seeing and change him from the wonderful man I thought he was into someone quite ordinary with annoying habits and faults. Okay, this has to do with this question here. That we talked about here. This had happened to my first marriage to Marvin and Chen. When I was in love with Marvin, he was almost perfect. But by the time my mother had had her say about him, 
I realized he was lazy, selfish, and mean. It wasn't until after we separated on nights when Shoshana was asleep and I was lonely that I wondered if perhaps my mother had poisoned my marriage. And now I worried for Rich because I knew my feelings for him could be damaged by my mother's comments. And I was afraid that I would then lose because Rich loved me in the same way I loved Shoshana. Nothing could change it. He expected nothing from me. Just the fact that I existed was enough for him. I'd, known, I'd never known love so pure and I was afraid it would become dirtied by my mother. I managed to persuade my mother to invite Rich, Shoshana and me over for a meal. Cooking was the way my mother expressed her love, her pride and her power. And I hoped this would soften her when she met Rich for the first time. Before she, we arrived, she tried to prepare Rich. Uh, no, before, before we arrived, I tried to prepare Rich by telling him he must praise her food. But Rich was not Chinese and there were so many things he did not know about, so many mistakes he could make. I could not save him from all of them. So during the meal, Rich followed American rules of politeness without having any idea how strange they seemed to my parents. Not only did he drop most of his food on his trousers because he insisted on using chopsticks, he also refused a second serving. He should have followed my father's example and taken a third or even a fourth. But what was worse, he failed to contradict my mother's modest statement that a particular dish lacked flavor. He thought it was polite to agree, but in her eyes, nothing could be ruder. These are cultural differences in table manners here. I knew she would not have a good word to say about him. Sure enough, when I was in the kitchen, helping her clear away the dishes, she found fault with his appearance, his habits, and even his character. There was nothing I could do. That night I lay in bed, despairing over this latest failure. Despair is feeling terrible, right? And Rich seemed blind to it all. He thought the dinner had gone well. I began to see him from my mother's point of view, weak, not strong, insensitive, not caring. And they're using this word sensitive means means understanding other people's feelings or understanding feelings. And then the opposite is insensitive. Not understanding feelings. My mother was doing it again, making me see black where I once saw white. So this phrase again. The next morning, I woke up late feeling furious with my mother. Furious means very angry. Without speaking to Rich, I jumped in the car and drove to my parents' apartment. I found my mother sleeping on the sofa in the living room. With her smooth, innocent face, she looked like a young girl again. All her strength was gone. She had no weapons. She looked powerless, defeated. And then I had a sudden fear that she looked like this because she was dead. She had died while I was having terrible thoughts about her. I had wished her out of my life. Ma, I cried sharply, Ma, I was starting to cry. Slowly, she opened her eyes and sat up. What has happened, she asked. Why are you crying? I felt confused. In a few seconds, I had gone from anger to pity to fear, and now I felt strangely weak. Nothing's happened, I said. I wanted to talk to you, to tell you, Rich and I are getting married. I waited to hear her protests, her dry remarks. Dry means um, 
it's hard to explain making fun of some something of course i know this she said this was worse than I had imagined. She had known all the time. I know you hate him, I said in a shaking voice, but hate? Why do you think I hate your future husband? You never want to hear about him, and then you criticize him just to hurt me. Ay, yeah. Why do you think these bad things about me? Her face looked old and full of sorrow. Ay, yeah. She thinks I'm this bad. She sat straight and proud on the sofa, her mouth held tightly shut and her eyes shining with angry tears. Oh, her strength, her weakness, both were pulling me apart. My mind was flying one way, my heart another. I sat down beside her and we went on talking. And gradually I realized what I had done. I had built an invisible wall between us to protect myself from what I saw as her secret weapons her skill at finding my weaknesses. But now a door in the wall had opened and I could finally see what was really there. An old woman getting a little bad tempered as she waited patiently for her daughter to invite her in. We have decided to postpone our wedding. My mother tells Rich that July is not a time to go to, is not a good time to go to China on our wedding trip. Too hot, your whole face will become red, she says, and Rich laughs. If we go in October, I think she would love to come with us, and I would hate it. Three weeks of her constant complaints about dirty chopsticks and cold soup. Yet part of me also thinks that the whole idea makes perfect sense. The three of us together, leaving our differences behind, stepping on the plane together, sitting side by side, moving west to reach the east. Okay, this is time to take a break. So let's go back. Uh, you can let's take a break for 10 minutes. Come back at 310. And when you come back, we're going to look at this discussion. This is the discussion on pages 36. 46. I'll put a link to I'll put a link to it on the front page. Almost working. Okay. 
and it's working. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not on mute here. Yeah, I'm not on
Okay. Are you taking her? Yeah. Yeah, I'm taking her. Just her though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She was here. Mm -hmm. Well, she hasn't had okay. Much red. Now let's go to. <laughs> yeah, that's both of JJ and Lulu do that. Yeah. Yep, I know. Okay, everybody, we're back. I'm sorry. Um, you've got a link in the chat to go to this discussion. Okay. Or there's also a link on the front page. Let me show you my screen here. Okay, so you've got a link to this uh, discussion on your front page here. Okay, ma. Huh? No. Okay, ma. Or you can go. Yeah, go on mute if you're talking to your family. I should have been doing it too. Um, or in the chat, if you look in the chat, you'll see the link to the discussion we're going to do. Here. And take about 15 minutes and try to post. Just choose one question. You don't have to do them all right now. Try to choose one question, okay? Okay, please go on mute, okay? If you're not talking to the class, put yourself on mute.
Let's see how people are doing. I'm going to add a question here. Professor, can, yeah. you, sh can you share the screen? Oh, please? I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, okay, I'm sharing now, I think. Well, nobody has responded to um, this idea about the mother's ability to see black where once there was white. And I added this question, do you think her mother really has that power to do that? Nobody's worked on this yet. Okay, we're going to go a little early today, um, but what I want you to do, I'm, I'm going to read one more of the stories in part two. Teacher, the yeah. embracing, the embracing me, it's like uh, proud of her daughter. No, um, it embarrassing. It's kind of the opposite. Um, when she says, the daughter says, you embarrass me. Let's see, where does she say that? It's the page number 38. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On page 38. Okay, it's embarrassing. Okay, uh, the daughter up here, the daughter is embarrassed when her mother boasts about her. When her mother talks about how good she is at chess. That means the daughter, she doesn't like about her mother's behavior, yeah? Right, right. Yeah, the daughter doesn't like the mother's behavior at in that situation. Okay, teacher, thank you. Thank you so much.
Okay, so this is a good long explanation. Okay, and she felt bad that her mother wanted to use her to show off. And this is what we learned about, this is right, what we learned about Waverly's life. But we still need to have some answers to this last question, which is kind of a key to what the chapter going is going on with the chapter. Uh, right now, why don't you make you decide? Tell me which one we have time to read one more. Which one do you want me to read? We've got um, the rules of the game, voice from the wall, without wood or best quality. Which one would you like me to read? You're going to have to do them all for homework. But right now, which one would you like to hear me talk and read about? Which one is the hardest story, teacher? Which that one is the hardest? Hmm. Well, I thought Please explain that one is better for us. Um... I think the voice from the wall is, is hard to understand myself. Yeah, you can do it right now. Yeah. Okay. So this is on page 46. No, 47, the voice from the wall. I'm going to have to go get my charger in a minute. In fact, I should go, hold on a minute. My charger is on the other side of the room. I have to go get it. I'll be back in just a minute. I'm not on mute. Oh, hush. Oh, hush, everybody. Stop it. Gotta think of some way to keep that in the wall. Damn it. It's going to be very uncomfortable. Okay. okay, let's hope that charges. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now, so we're going to read Voice from the Wall.
And that one This is on page 47. And Lena is the daughter of Ying Ying. And remember, Ying Ying is the mother who got lost. And as a child, or was the child. And uh, saw the moon, the, the moon lady to turn into a man, right? And their last name is English. The husband is American. Okay, later she married an American and came to the US. And Lena is their daughter, and she's speaking. Okay. All my life, I have thought it was important to know the worst possible thing that can happen to you so you can find out how to avoid it. Because even as a young child, I could sense the unspoken terrors that surrounded our house. Unspoken means terrible things that we did not speak about. The ones that chased my mother until she hid in a secret dark corner of her mind and still they found her. I watched over the years as they ate her up piece by piece until she disappeared and became like a ghost. And this is talking about how um, Ying Yang was afraid of many, of a lot of things. And basically, it sounds like kind of a mental illness. It sounds as, as if she suffered from a kind of mental illness. Because she was afraid of things that weren't, she feared things that were not real. I'm going to get the questions from the hmm. It's one of the questions to think about. And then she talks about communication between her parents problems with that. And then we talk about something that happened in pages 50 and 51. And then we we'll get to talking about Lena's marriage and what's wrong with Lena's marriage. And then they talk about being having the power to predict things that will happen in the future.
Okay, so I'm going on reading on page 47. As I remember it, the dark side of my mother came from the basement of our house. I was five and she tried to hide it from me. She put two locks and a chain on the door and pushed a heavy chair against it. But this made it so mysterious that I spent all my energies trying to get in until the day I finally managed to open the door only to fall headfirst into the dark space. And it was only after I stopped screaming that my mother told me about the bad man who lived in the basement and why I should never open the door again. He had lived there for thousands of years, she said, and he was so evil and hungry that if she had not rescued me so quickly, he would have planted five babies in me and then eaten us all, throwing our bones on the dirty floor. So, so this is a terrible kind of dream or imagining that the mother is having. And then she talks about it to her little girl and the little girl becomes very frightened also. Um, okay. imagine things and, and tells her child about them. Even though they aren't true. But it's very scary for the child. After that, I began to see terrible things. Devils dancing in a hole I had dug in the sand. Devils are evil imaginary beings. Lightning with eyes that searched for little children to strike. An insect wearing the face of a child. I saw these things with my Chinese eyes, the part of me that I got from my mother. Most people didn't know I was half Chinese. When they first saw me, they thought I looked like my father, English Irish. But if they looked closely, they could see the Chinese parts, the smooth bones of my face, and the long shape of my eyes. I used to open my eyes very wide to make them look rounder, but then my father always asked why me why I looked so afraid. I have a photo of my mother with the same frightened look. My mother had married her in China and brought her to America with him so the picture was taken when she first arrived in America as a new bride. She never talked about her life in China, but my father said he had saved her from a terrible life there. So this is kind of a mystery. We don't know what happened. In the photo, her eyes are staring up past the camera, wide open. She often looked like this, waiting for something to happen. Only later, she lost the struggle to keep her eyes open. And I'm not actually sure what that means. My father, who only knew a few Chinese expressions, here we're going to talk about the communication problems in the family. Okay, the communications between uh, the father and the mother, between Lena and her mother, and between Lena and her father. My father, who knew only, who only knew a few Chinese expressions, had insisted my mother should learn English. So with him, she spoke in moods and sign language, looks and silences, a combination of English and Chinese. Then he 
would put words in her mouth. I think mom is trying to say she's tired. He would whisper to me and she became moody. Moody means um, acting in a strange, acting in strange ways that people can't predict. But with me, when we were alone, my mother would speak Chinese, saying things that my father could not possibly imagine and that I had difficulty understanding. You must not walk in any direction but to school and back home, she warned, when she had described, decided I was old enough to walk by myself. Why, I asked. You can't understand these things, she said. Why not? Because I haven't put it in your mind yet. Why not? Ay, yes, such questions. Because it is too terrible to consider. A man can steal you off the street, sell you to someone else, make you have a baby, then you'll kill the baby. And then the police, when the police find this baby, you'll go to prison and die there. So she's making up a whole terrifying story for this child. That I knew this was not a true answer. It was her way of warning me to help me avoid all danger now and in the future. When I was 10, we moved house to a block of flats on a steep hill. I hoped we could leave all the old fears behind, but my mother did not seem happy in our new apartment. Every day she rearranged the furniture. Rearranged the furniture means put it, the furniture in different places. Re, it means again. doing this? I asked her one day. When something goes against your nature, she whispered worriedly, you're not in balance. This apartment block was built too steep and a bad wind from the top blows all your strength back downhill so you can never make progress. My father just smiled when I asked him about it and explained that she was expecting a baby. So he had a simple answer to it. He seemed to think it was quite normal behavior. I wondered why he was never worried. Was he blind? My mother did not speak of the joys of having a new baby, but talked about a heaviness around her, a lack of balance. It made me feel very anxious. My mother had changed my bedroom round to make room for the baby's bed. And now my bed was right next to the thin wall that divided us from the neighbor's, our neighbor's flat. I knew that a family called the Sorcies lived there. The first night I could hear a heated argument. Heated means angry. And then sound of a girl, I heard a woman's angry voice, then the higher sound of a girl shouting back. I could hear accusations and protests, then a terrible crashing and banging and the sound of a violent beating. Somebody was killing or someone was being killed. I lay back my heart beating wildly at what my ears and imagination had just witnessed. Witnessed means seen or known about. A girl had just been killed and I hadn't been able to prevent it. The horror of it all. 
But the next night, the girl came back to life with more screams, more beatings, her life once more in danger. And so it continued night after night, a voice behind my wall telling me that this was the worst thing that could happen. The terror of not knowing when it would ever stop. When I saw the girl coming out of the flat one morning, I was amazed to see that she looked healthy and cheerful. She didn't seem like a girl who had been killed a hundred times. I kept out of her way, feeling guilty that I knew all about her family life. Okay, and then we're moving ahead. One day, my parents' friends, Auntie Suyan and Uncle Canning, picked me up from school and work and took me to the hospital to see my mother. I knew it must be serious, and when we arrived, I found my mother sitting my, by my mother's bedside, looking desperately worried. Okay, now we're looking at what's happening here. It means so worried that he didn't know what to do. She held my hand, her whole body shaking, and murmured to me in Chinese. Lena, what's she saying? cried my father. For once he had no words to put into her mouth. And for once I had no ready answer. It struck me that the worst possible thing had happened. It struck me means I understood something. It struck me that the worst possible thing that had happened, that what she had been fearing had come true. And so I listened. I could hear the baby screaming inside me, whispered my mother. He didn't want to be born. But when he came, I saw he once he had a large head so terrible, I could not stop staring at it. His head was open so I could see all the way back to where his thoughts were supposed to be and there was nothing there. Um, okay, the baby, what she's describing is the baby was born. With a birth defect. I haven't known the number it's called. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but um, the child's brain fails to develop. And it is born with no brain, it's born with the head open and there's no brain. And of course, uh, of course, Okay, that it, it, it is either it is either dead or will die soon. And it, I, I I mean reading it, I can see that this is what happened, that the, she had a baby who had this birth defect. And then this empty head rose up and looked at me. I knew he could see my thoughts and how I had not wanted this baby. So now this is, that part of it is kind of her imagination. I could not tell my father what she said. He was so sad already. How could I make it worse by telling him she was crazy? So I just said, she hopes the baby is very happy on the other side means, uh, on the other side means having died. We talk about when someone dies, 
we say that they have gone to the other side. So she did not translate what her mother said. She just said something that would make much more sense and be more calming. And she thinks we should leave now. After the baby's death, my mother fell apart. It means um, her life. It's, it's not like she became more crazy. After the baby's death, my mother fell apart, not all at once, but piece by piece, like plates falling off a shelf one by one. She often had to stop because she was doing, because she was crying so much, or holding her head in despair. Uh, and I think we've talked about where despair, terrible, great sadness. or simply staring into distance with empty eyes. I became nervous, constantly waiting for something to happen. And I could feel every movement in our silent flat. And at night I could hear the loud fights on the other side of my bedroom wall where a girl was being beaten to death. I used to wonder which was worse, our side or theirs. And it made me feel better to think that after all, the girl next door had a more unhappy life. But one evening the doorbell rang and when I went to the door, the girl from the other side of the wall came in. She smiled at me and then rushed past me towards my bedroom. I followed her in great surprise and I saw her opening the window. What are you doing? I asked. My mother threw me out of the house. She laughed. Now she thinks I'm going to go back and apologize, but I'm not. So what are you going to do? I asked breathlessly. I'm going to climb out of your window and back in through mine, she answered, she replied. That way I won't have to wait outside in the cold until she unlocks the front door. She'll pretend to be angry with me, of course. We do this kind of thing all the time. And then she climbed through my window onto the fire escape staircase and silently made her way back home. I stared at the open window, wondering about her. How could she be, go back? Didn't she see how terrible her life was? Later that night, I heard screams and shouts as the mother discovered her daughter was back in her room. And then I heard them laughing and crying, shouting with love. I was amazed. I could almost see them holding and kissing each other. I was crying for joy with them because I had been wrong. And in my memory, I can still feel the hope that was born in me that night. I held on to this hope night after night, year after year. I would watch my mother lying in bed, talking softly to herself. But I knew that this, the worst possible thing, would one day stop. I saw, still saw bad things in my mind, but I saw other things too. I saw a girl complaining that the pain of not being seen was unbearable. I saw the mother lying in bed. Then the girl pulled out a sharp knife and told her mother, you must die the death of a thousand cuts. It is the only way to save you. Now this is probably on top of page 53. This probably did not actually happen. This is her imagination. This is Lena's imagination. And this is actually a part of the story that is hard to understand and that actually I don't understand very well. 
Her mother accepted this and closed her eyes. The knife came down and the mother screamed and cried out in terror and pain. But when she opened her eyes, she saw no blood. The girl said, the girl here is Lena. A way that she made her mother better. The girl said, do you see now? The mother nodded. Now I have already experienced the worst. And after this, there is no worst possible thing. And the daughter said, now you must come back to the other side. Then you will see why you were wrong. And the girl took her mother's hand and pulled her through the wall. So all of this is kind of in imagination that's happening. To this day, to this day, I believe that my mother has the mysterious ability to see things before they happen. She thought her baby would die and it did. She knew that my father would die at the age of 74 because a plant he had given her had died. And now that she is visiting my husband and me in our new house, I wonder what kind of future she will see for us. Harold and I were lucky to find this place, which is right out of the country, but only a 40 minute drive from San Francisco. My mother, however, cannot believe how much we paid for what was basically a farm building with some expensive additions. It annoys me that she only sees the disadvantages. But when I look around, everything she has said is true. And this convinces me that she can see what else is going on between Harold and me. Our problems are deep, so deep that I don't even know where the bottom is. Now that my mother is staying with us for a week, we have to pretend that nothing is the matter. But I know that she will see through our pretense. I'm going to go ahead and finish this and then we'll stop for today. Um, the rest of it is not too hard to understand. Um, I remember something else she saw, my mother, when, when she, I was eight years old. She had looked in my rice bowl and told me that I would marry a bad man, a mean man with scars on his face, unless I finished up all my rice. I immediately thought of a 12 year old boy, a cruel boy, a mean boy I knew whose face was covered with tiny scars. His name was Arnold. I didn't want him to be my future husband, so I ate up all my rice and smiled confidently at my mother. And this is what we're talking about here. Soon my dislike for Arnold grew to such hatred that I found a way to make him die. At school, the teacher showed us here again, this is her imagination. And it's similar to her mother's. At school, the teacher showed us a film of people from Africa suffering from the most terrible skin diseases. I knew that if my mother had been in the room, she would have told me that these poor people were victims of future husbands and wives who had failed to eat platefuls of food. So I did an awful thing. I began to leave more rice in my bowl. I did not finish my vegetables or chicken or sandwiches. Perhaps as a result of my action, Arnold would catch a skin disease, move to Africa and die. That was certainly my intention. My intention means what I wanted. In fact, he didn't die until five years later. I had almost stopped eating then, not because of Arnold, but because I had long forgotten 
not because of Arlon, Arnold, whom I had long forgotten, but in order to be fashionably thin, like all the other 13 year old girls. Okay. Um, Lena talks about anorexia. Something we call It's usually young girls do not eat. In fact, he, uh, let's see. From the newspaper, my father read out the news of Arnold's death caused by complications from an infection the boy had had when he was 12. This means back at the time when she was eating the rice or not eating the rice. This is a terrible shame, said my mother, looking at me. I thought she could see through me and that she knew I was the one who made Arnold die. I was terrified. That night, I stole a huge pot of ice cream from the freezer and forced myself to eat it all. I felt ill and miserably unhappy all night. Of course, now I can see that probably I had nothing at all to do with Arnold's death, but I still believe that somehow we deserve what we get. I didn't get Arnold, I got Harold. Harold and I work in the same company, only he is the boss and I am the employee. We met eight years ago when we were both working for another company. We started seeing each other for working lunches to talk about projects. And we always divided the bill equally, even though I usually ordered a salad. Later, when we started spending evenings out together, we still divided the bill. And we just continued that way, sharing all the costs. I even encouraged it. It didn't really bother me. Harold told me I was extraordinary. He's very special. We're talking about the problems of the marriage. Can I not copy that question? Extraordinary means very special. He had never met another woman who was so balanced, so organized, and yet so lovable. I remember wondering how such a remarkable person as Harold could think I was extraordinary. Now that I'm angry with him, it's hard to remember what was so remarkable about him. But at the time, I felt awfully lucky and very worried that all this undeserved good luck might one day slip away. But I knew I was smart. After all, it was my idea that he should start his own business designing restaurants. And when he did, I went to work for him. I was the one who gave him most of the ideas that have helped him make his company so successful. I love my work when I don't think about it too much. And when I do think about it, how little I get paid, how hard I work, I get upset. Harold has gone shopping, so my mother and I are alone in the house. She is looking at a piece of paper on the fridge door. It's a list of the different things Harold and I have paid for so far this week. At the end of the week, the one who has spent the less, spent less pays the other back. What is this writing? She asks, asks my mother in Chinese. Oh, nothing really, just things we share. I say as casually as I can. Casually means calmly. Yeah, because this is actually kind of a strange thing for a husband and wife to do with money.
She looks at me frowning. Knowing what she's seeing, I feel embarrassed. I'm relieved she doesn't see the other half of it. The endless discussions about who should pay for what, that they, these are the discussions that she and her husband have. Why do you do this? My mother asks sadly. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed, a, I missed a, a paragraph. This you don't share, cries my mother, pointing to ice cream on the list. It is true that I could never bear to eat, eat it after the night I heard of Arnold's death. It comes as a shock to realize that Har Harold is, Harold has never noticed I don't touch any of the ice cream he brings home every Friday evening. Why do you do this, asks my mother sadly. I don't really know. It's something we started before we got married. And for some reason, we never stop. After dinner, I take my mother to the guest room. There is an odd looking table by the bed with a vase of flowers on it. She puts her handbook on the table, handbag on the table, and the flowers tremble, means they shake. Careful, it's not very strong, I say. The table is a poorly designed piece made by Harold in his student days. I've always wondered why he's so proud of it. What use for, asked my mother, not good balance. When I go downstairs, I'm feeling furious with Harold. I go to the list on the fridge and cross out ice cream under his name. What's going on here, he asks. I just don't think you should make me pay for your ice cream anymore. What, you've decided you don't like ice cream now? I've never liked it. I've hated ice cream almost all my life. Harold's mouth drop, drops open. After a while, he says, I guess I assumed you were just trying to lose weight. Oh, well, well, you were wrong, I shout. What is this? Why don't you say what's really the matter? I don't know, everything. That This now is, uh, Lena is talking. Everything, what we share, what we don't share, the way we put a price on everything. I'm so tired of it. I start to cry, which I know Harold hates but I can't help it because I realize now that I don't know why I started this argument. None of it seems right. None of it makes sense. I can admit to nothing and I am in complete despair. I just think we have to change things, I say, when I can control my voice. We need to think about our relationship, not just who owes what. My God, says Harold and sighs. Finally, he says in a hurt voice, well, I know our marriage is about a lot more than just paying the bills. And if you don't, then I think you should just think carefully before you change things. And now I don't know what to think. What am I saying? What is he saying? We sit in the room in silence. And then I hear a crash from upstairs. I'll go and see, I say. Okay, so uh, her marriage is breaking up. And it's not real clear and obvious, except from the, you hear the crash, the crash from upstairs. It's, it's, a, it's a metaphor, a symbol for the marriage breaking up. The door is open, and this is upstairs in the bedroom. The door is open, but the room is dark, so I call out, Ma? The table lies on its side on the floor with the broken pieces of the vase around it. My mother is sitting by the open window, a dark shape visible and can be seen against the night sky. I can't see her face. Fallen down, she says simply. She doesn't apologize. It doesn't matter, I said, picking up the pieces. I knew it would happen. She's talking about I knew it would happen. about the table and the vape.
both of those things, I knew they would break. She knew that these things would break. Then why don't you stop it, asks my mother. And it's such a simple question. Okay, so, and her mother asks why she can't stop the breakup of her marriage. But Lena does not have an answer. Okay, um, we're going to stop early today. Um, I'll, I'm going to post these notes. And for homework, It's going to be a uh, uh, May for May nineteenth. Okay, we've, you've got these four discussions. You need to read these four stories. And you've got a discussion for each one. You have to post one time to each of these discussions. So there are four of these stories. And then there are four little quizzes that are not very hard. Okay. And then I took, and that's going to be homework. Okay. And at this point, you can, you can go if you can leave today. If you have questions, stay and I'll answer any questions. But we're going to stop there today, okay? Bye. Okay, bye-bye, teacher. Bye. Bye. I'll bye. see you. Professor? Yeah. Do we have final exam? Uh, yes, there will be a final exam. And what I'm going to have, let's see. It's on, the, it's on the syllabus. I think we're going to spend our time up until the final exam working on joy luck club let me share my screen here the most of the question from the joy luck club i think what i will have you do is write something about the joy luck club um Yeah, we just have wow. We just have next time. We'll look. We'll look at the th part three next time, and then the final exam is on the twenty sixth. Um, 
Okay, I, I think, yeah, it's gonna, it's too much to expect you to write at this point. Um, I will, it will be questions about the Joy Luck Club. It'll be open book questions about Joy Luck Club. Okay. Okay. Is what it will be. Uh, professor, mm -hmm. you, you didn't uh, send the second draft, right? For the summary why okay. people yeah. immigrate. Well, if you got it, if you got it to me late, I have not sent the second draft and, and okay. I will do it. I'm falling behind and it's getting very busy at the end of the semester. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If, if I got it late, then I have not sent it to you yet, but I, I'm, I'm working on it. I will get it to you, okay? Okay, thank you so much. Have a good day. Okay, okay, bye. -bye. bye. The second, thank you, thank you. second draft. We want to do it the final again, the draft, the uh, essay. No, no, I am grading. Um, this is about the immigration, right? I'm grading that. I'm uh, grading that, and I haven't done it yet. Don't. Okay. If you have given me two drafts, don't worry. Not final draft. This is the final. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to grade the second draft. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, I'm going to end the meeting now. Okay. Anybody? Bye bye.